I deliberately didn't bring in too many statistics in this presentation to make it more of a popular kind, but these are some of the figures uh, in terms of catchment area, water availability per capita, runoff per capita, runoff per hectare, annual surface water potential. There are projections up to 2050. How reliable they are, we don't know, but uh, we have done some exercise, uh, including Mr. Mohile from uh, Central Water Commission when he was the chairman of Brahmaputra board. Uh, there are papers and uh, some projections were done in terms of water demand and future water demand. As you can see, per capita water availability, for example, if you see, it is 18,400 cubic meter, uh, one of the highest, you know, that is possible. But how much of this is actually exploitable and made into the benefit of people is a big question mark because water resources have not been developed properly and it has not been mapped. Spend much time on this, but uh, in future, if any one of you have interest, uh, many of these data are available and based on that, we can develop future plans. Uh, perhaps this is an opportunity also, uh, considering this August gathering, that we can talk about a few issues uh, that uh, why this whole uh, water resource, such a vast resource, is not so far developed. There are peculiar geographical disadvantages. I'm sure you have already appreciated that all the rivers are different. The Meghalaya rivers are different. This uh, floodplain rivers are such huge in alluvium. Uh, we have problem that uh, drinking water intake. Many drinking water intake have become obsolete because in two years, the river decided to change course and gone somewhere else. So physically, the river is no longer there where we used to draw the drinking water from. So now you'll find in Assam, most of the drinking water intakes are on barges and with this expandable system that you can actually take the pipe, intake pipe for a couple of kilometers if necessary to tap the water. So these are some of the peculiarities. Uh, the other problem is that because of its uh, strategic location, we have uh, this classifiedness of the data. So sometimes even for, uh, you know, essential project, we have no access to proper database. So we cannot make a complete scientific planning. Uh, there are difficult institutional arrangement issues. It is very scattered. There are, you know, groundwater is different, surface water and all those. These are not exceptionally different for Northeast. I'm sure for India, by and large, is similar. There are bureaucratic complexities. Uh, other issue, of course, is that projects are mostly decided at a national level and sometimes the local stakeholder consultation doesn't happen. And also this issue of riparian consultation even, even among states, uh, states, you know, has not been happening as much. Flood and erosion is uh, one of the main uh, hazard, main problem that uh, Assam is facing. Again, uh, recently, there was a flash flood and this uh, family got stranded. They got into that tree. There are eight people climbing that tree. And there are a whole lot of, you know, TV media people standing, focusing on that tree. We have, I thought of bringing the video. It is very disturbing, so I didn't do that. And uh, the rapid action force and other people came to rescue them. They fell in the middle of the river. But after some time, before something could be taken, this tree fell down and all these eight people of the family became on the water. They are tough people, you know, they can withstand flood. They are living with flood. You can see the bridge behind. So they're very close to the river. But this water was not water. There was a huge slurry of boulders and clays. And, and now because this trans Arunachal highway is happening, a lot of additional materials are coming to the river. So this whole viscous material, three of these younger children, the daughter, for example, she could not actually swim across. In fact, none of them could. And before even our rapid action force could do something, uh, some of the locals jumped into the river and rescued five of them, but three of them died. And this was in front of the eyes, you know, they, they drowned. So these are very, very sad kind of events that happen. Uh, again, I can elaborate on that why this has happened, because the highway and the railway track that has come up now have narrowed down the constricted the path of the water so much that this huge volume of water because of a flash flood could not get in there and you can see the whole ferocity of the water nobody can actually see the peculiarities the railway line is washed out the whole base is gone and people are still kind of trying to cross over i'm sure these are familiar figure from even bihar and some other areas but this whole erosion and all these efforts going on for boulder pitching such a huge uh, each of these spar Rocky spar, they cost at least 10 crore rupees each. And sometimes we have about, 
you know, 15 of them at a particular patch of maybe a couple of kilometers to save that stretch. Now, it doesn't really make a good cost benefit analysis in terms of saving the hinterland, which is basically rural area, you know. If at all there is a sentimental value, I think government sometimes do not feel the justification of putting so much of funding. So, this is a problem again, I don't know at what level it should be addressed, but it's an ongoing problem. We need a very collective... Uh, I have some more. I Okay, fine. I'll just try to then uh, get quickly. So, okay, let's go through this visual quickly. This is an embankment situation. You can see that how things happen, okay? Um, people are standing out there and after some time, this narrow part of the river is given in and the entire part behind the area got flooded. Similarly, okay, I'll not go to the detail of the statistics part then. These are embankments done during even the king's time and eventually you have this whole weak material giving into the river. So this is a peculiar problem. Uh, the responses so far have been to have this so-called porcupines, concrete porcupines. In fact, in the process, I think millions of porcupines have gone to the riverbed and junked it. Uh, the other issue is the complexity of this hydro initiative. There are a lot of questions are being raised, reservoir sedimentation and all that. Again, maybe that will be a different issue. I'll not, I'll just flag the issue. <coughs> Bank erosion and all those issues. Um, are happening. The climate change again, let me quickly show you something here. The Hadley Center model, you know, the entire China, this is China, this is the Northeast here. You see in the B1, B2 scenario also, uh, this is the area where it is predicted that by 61, uh, 1990 baseline projection to 2071, 2080, uh, there's an increase of rainfall by about three millimeter per day average. Of course, it will happen during the monsoon. So there are some projections then in Nepal, in um, Brahmaputra Basin, and some part of coastal Orissa. Even under B2 scenario, there are possibility of much intense flooding. So one has to really, again, take note of this future uh, implication in terms of intensification of flood and erosion problem. So flood management, there are many new technologies that are coming up. Uh, it did not work out. There's a Malaysian company who tried to have these geo bags and geo tube, thinking it to be ultimate solution, but this particular flooding season, a part of this is actually washed away. So again, we are back at the square one that what to do. The porcupines are being used. You can see millions of them, hundreds, thousands, and so many different sections. So they're not really helping us much uh, in terms of managing this hazard part of the river. So there is this uh, credibility and adequacy deficit we are looking into, how to overcome them. There are scientific and technical tools we have to get into. And um, this will, of course, open up a larger uh, issue of digital Brahmaputra to prototype Brahmaputra to model Brahmaputra. The issue we are making is that we now have a robust plan for Ganga Basin Development Authority. But uh, should we really wait for Brahmaputra also to go to in terms of inequality to that extent and then kind of think of this grandiose plan of, you know, $1,600 million to save the river and that too also with a lot of uncertainty about its success. <clears throat> so we need definitely the policy outlook here in terms of IWRM, um, you know, having perhaps the climate change dimension also integrated into. There are geopolitical challenges in terms of transboundary issues. There are issues of participatory processes, interstate and international deliberations then the institution and the other management tools, uh, ADB and others are moving in. I don't know um, how much the whole entirety of the process is being appreciated as of now, uh, looking at the peculiarities involved. <coughs> okay, the plan is to see that whether one can develop a kind of a Brahmaputra River Conservancy Commission or a river basin authority like the Yellow River or the Mississippi. Two months back, there was a trip where I was in the Mari Darling Basin and they are doing a wonderful work uh, at a much lesser challenging river. So we need to again look into all those. Uh, let me kind of quickly <coughs> reflect on the main theme of this particular series of talks, the rivers in the north is, are they dying or living? If you look at this whole river shifting, I'm sure we have a lot of dead rivers because the river has left the channel and that part has become dead, you know, in a, in a sense. There is no river anymore. So some of these issues are there, but is it that we are talking about or the existing rivers of the Northeast, which are not merely moving masses of water. There's a whole deal of 
complex geomorphic, chemical and biological process in motion. It is a landscape actually. It is a habitat mosaic that support a wide variety of aquatic and riparian species. It, it just <laughs> carries on them including the microbial part which we hardly have recognized so far. So the ecological health and the viability is basically its natural florism and which is being challenged more and more. So we have to see that how the natural variable flows, they create and maintain the dynamics between the channel, the floodplain, the wetland. On both sides, we have about 3,500 wetlands just in the Assam floodplain. And how the magnitude and frequency and the high and the low flows, they consequently regulate numerous ecological processes. These are again universal thing, but maybe for the North is reverse. Considering its pristinity, there are um, perhaps need of more, you know, keen observation and science to put into those exercises. Uh, the wetlands are very important nursery grounds for fish and export. We have already seen it over a lifetime, personally for some of us who has grown up by the side of this river and the wetlands. Variability is definitely very critical to the ecosystem and we must respect and protect that functioning and the native biodiversity has to be protected. Rivers, if it is highly altered, there is a threshold, there is an environmental flow, there is a regulation. You know, all those we have to see that how we support natural processes. We are engaging more and more discussion into more and more discussion to see that can we have a compromise that we should not dam up all our rivers to make them dead. I think in some sense they become dead rivers. If you look at the Northeast rivers, how vibrant they are right now. I hope someday all of you can go and have a look at some of them. We are junking the river with this kind of structural measures, but probably this bamboo is more sustainable. You know, we have local material. I can tell you what is happening by Brahmaputra board and all. Maybe we'll save it for the next time. And uh, <coughs> if you look at this kind of dichotomy is happening. Somewhere flooding, somewhere, you know, the landscape is ruined by different people. And the other issue is that to the end, the dying urban rivers. Many of these tributaries are along the urban side. We have this Bharalu River, which is flowing to Guwahati city. And uh, like many other rivers, what is now covered under the Ganga Action Plan or the Ganga Basin Authority, if, if you look at uh, pristine river like Bharalu, which originates as a you know, hill called Basista, a very beautiful stream here. Three streams, Sandha, Lalita, and Kanta joins to form Basista. But as they go down the river, if they reach the confluence with Brahmaputra, you see, it's a stagnant, dirty water. And this is all because of the city. We are actually looking at a Bharalu restoration plan right now under the National River Conservation Project. Not sure how far will be the success, but we're trying to do something like this, that some of the good practices to be maintained along the urban river system. This is also part of Bharalu only at some stretches. So the idea is to kind of bring back or retain. Many of the Gohati wetlands are flocked by these migratory birds in the winter. So we want to see that how, uh, I think, spiritually, poetically, otherwise, the rivers are maintained its natural state. And probably, we have to finally, you know, think of that how we maintain the river as natural as possible. And probably that is the clue that where the river flows, I think everything will still live. That's very important. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I think I took a little long, knowing that we have more time. Uh, but it's now, I think, Mr. Ayer will open up the discussion. And you can have questions, other comments. And maybe appreciating some of the points we raised, maybe you can even provide possible some future solutions how to look at these beautiful rivers in the Northeast. Thank you.